I've always been more of a loner, even when I was a kid. My name is Mandy, and I've always been good at keeping myself busy. It's not that I'm antisocial or anything, I just enjoy being by myself most of the time. My mom, bless her heart, noticed early on that I liked to be independent. Instead of trying to change me, she encouraged it in a positive way. She introduced me to cooking when I was just tall enough to reach the kitchen counter. I took it all in like a sponge. Mom didn't just teach me recipes, she taught me to really understand food. We'd visit cafes and restaurants around town, and she would explain each dish to me. As I got older, my interest in food grew even stronger. I started reading articles by famous restaurant critics and realized that food was about more than just taste and texture, it was about how it looked and the atmosphere of the place too. One day, I told my mom I wanted to write about food. She looked proud and said, then you better learn everything there is to know about it, Mandy. So, that's what I did. I enrolled in a culinary school to become an expert in cooking. After graduating, I didn't stop there, I took journalism courses to improve my writing. I wanted to make people feel like they could taste the food just by reading my words. My first job as a restaurant critic was for a small local newspaper. I wrote about a little American restaurant, describing how the homemade pasta melted in my mouth and how the smell of garlic and basil made me feel like I was in a Tuscan kitchen. To my surprise, people loved it. My editor called me the next day and said, Kid, you've got a gift. Keep this up, and you'll go far. That's when I knew I had found my calling. I worked for different newspapers and magazines, gaining a reputation for honest and fun reviews. The big change came when I started my own social media pages. Suddenly, I wasn't just writing for magazines, I was connecting with food lovers from all over the world. My followers grew, and they were always excited to hear my thoughts on the latest food trends and hidden restaurants. One evening, I was at a new farm-to-table restaurant called The Rustic Spoon, sitting at a cozy table and taking notes for my review. As I wrote about the atmosphere, I noticed an older couple at the next table looking at me. The woman was whispering to her husband and staring at me. I smiled politely, used to being recognized, and went back to my notepad. Suddenly, I heard her voice, warm and excited. Excuse me, you're Mandy Rose, right? The food critic. I nodded and said, that's me. Nice to meet you. Oh, I'm such a fan, she said excitedly. I follow all your posts. Would you, would you like to join us for dinner? I hesitated. Normally, I like to eat alone when I'm working but their genuine enthusiasm made me think twice. So, I joined them at their table. The woman introduced herself as Melissa, her husband as Johnson, and then pointed to a young man I had noticed before. And this is our son, Daniel, she added. Daniel looked up from his phone and smiled. Hey, he said with a grin, nice to meet you. We quickly fell into easy conversation. Melissa and Johnson were eager to hear about my recent travels, while Daniel kept chiming in with funny remarks that had me laughing despite myself. As the evening went on, I found myself enjoying their company more than I expected. Daniel, in particular, was very easy to talk to. We discovered we both loved indie films and cheesy puns. When it was time to leave, Daniel seemed a bit unsure and asked, Hey, um, would it be okay if I got your number? You know, in case I need restaurant recommendations or something. I felt a little flutter in my stomach that had nothing to do with the food. Sure, I said, for restaurant recommendations. We started texting that same night. At first, it was just about food and restaurants, but soon we were talking about everything. Our conversations became the highlight of my day. A month later, Daniel asked me out on a real date, and I said yes without hesitation. Our first date was at a quirky little bistro I'd been wanting to try. Sitting across from him, I realized how comfortable I felt. 
There was none of the awkwardness I usually expected from first dates. A year after we met, Daniel proposed. It wasn't a big, flashy event, he knew that wasn't my style. Instead, he made me dinner, a sweet attempt that ended with slightly burnt steak and lumpy mashed potatoes, and asked me to marry him over dessert. How could I say no to that? After the wedding, we moved into my apartment. We were practical about our finances, creating a joint account for shared expenses. Since I earned more, I contributed more, but we both felt it was fair. Living together revealed new things about Daniel. He had a habit of leaving dishes in the sink, his clothes scattered everywhere, and his toothpaste tube was always uncapped. Coffee mugs seemed to multiply on every surface. I bit my tongue, reminding myself that I wasn't perfect either. It's just an adjustment period, I told myself. We'll find our rhythm. And slowly, we did. Daniel started making more of an effort to clean up, and I learned to relax my standards a bit. It wasn't perfect, but it was ours. Five months later, it was time for our first vacation together. Standing in the airport with our luggage, I felt a wave of excitement. I turned to Daniel, ready to share my joy, but noticed his eyes were fixed on something behind me. I turned around and saw Melissa and Johnson walking toward us with big smiles. They only had small carry-on bags, like they were going on a short trip instead of a week-long vacation. Surprise! Melissa said, hugging Daniel. We could have let you three lovebirds have all the fun, could we? My heart sank. This wasn't part of the plan. I looked at Daniel, hoping he would explain, but he avoided eye contact. It's kind of a family tradition, he muttered. We always vacation together. I forced a smile, hiding my disappointment. How nice, I managed to say. But don't you need more luggage for a week-long trip? Johnson waved it off. Oh, we'll just buy what we need when we get there, no sense in dragging heavy suitcases around, right? The first few days of the vacation were a blur. I focused on the positives, the beautiful scenery, the interesting new foods I discovered, and the locals' warm hospitality. But as the days went by, I started to notice how much Melissa and Johnson spent. They shopped like there was no tomorrow, ate at the fanciest restaurants, and never seemed to worry about the bill. One evening, as we sat at another expensive restaurant, I couldn't hold back my curiosity any longer. I leaned over to Daniel and whispered, How can your parents afford all this? Aren't they retired? Daniel looked uncomfortable, shifting in his seat. They're, uh, just good with money, he muttered, suddenly very interested in the menu. I wanted to ask more, but at that moment, Melissa began telling a story about her bridge club, putting an end to our conversation. As the vacation came to an end, I found myself eager to go home. The day after we returned, I decided to check our joint account, curious to see how much we had spent. When I logged in, my eyes went wide in shock, the balance was much lower than I expected, alarmingly low. Daniel, can you come here for a minute? I called, my voice tense. I turned the screen toward him. Care to explain this? Daniel's face went pale as he looked at the numbers. I might have used our account to cover some of mom and dad's expenses, Daniel admitted quietly. I took a deep breath, trying to keep my anger under control. Daniel, that was our money, and I contributed most of it. You should have talked to me first. I know, I know, he said, reaching for my hand. I'm sorry, Nancy. It won't happen again, I promise. A month went by and things slowly got back to normal. Daniel kept his word and didn't touch our joint account without discussing it with me first. I tried to let go of what happened during the vacation and focused on my work and our life together. One cool autumn evening, Daniel came home looking excited. Hey, Nancy, he said, wrapping his arms around me from behind as I stood at the kitchen counter, cutting vegetables for dinner. I've got an idea. 
How about we go on an overnight picnic this weekend? Just the two of us, a rented motor home and the great outdoors. What do you say? The idea sounded great, and we spent the next few days getting ready for our little adventure. I packed a cooler with gourmet sandwiches, homemade potato salad, and a bottle of wine. Daniel took care of renting a small motor home and planning our route. We arrived at the campsite in the afternoon. The place was beautiful, surrounded by tall pine trees and a clear lake. Daniel parked the motor home in our spot, and we stepped outside to enjoy the fresh air. That's when I saw a familiar car pulling into the space next to ours. Melissa and Johnson got out, waving excitedly. Surprise! Melissa called out. We thought we'd join you on your little getaway. I turned to Daniel, hoping to see the same shock I felt on his face. Instead, he just looked sheepish, avoiding my eyes. Daniel, I said, my voice calm but firm, did you tell them about our trip? Before Daniel could answer, Melissa came over and hugged me tightly. Isn't this exciting? A family camping trip, she exclaimed. I forced a smile, but I couldn't help noticing that they showed up with no supplies, no tent, no food, not even a change of clothes. As the evening went on, it was clear that our romantic getaway had turned into a family event. Melissa and Johnson took over the conversation telling us stories about their past camping trips. They also helped themselves to our food and wine, leaving barely enough for Daniel and me. When it was time to sleep, another issue came up. Our small motor home wasn't built for five people, and Daniel turned to his mother and said, You and Dad can take the bedroom. Nancy and I will figure something out in the car. So, instead of enjoying a cozy night together in the motor home, I found myself uncomfortably curled up in the back seat of our car while Daniel snored softly in the front. The next morning, with blurry eyes and feeling stiff from our awkward sleeping arrangements, I suggested to Daniel that we cut the trip short. The drive home was tense, filled with awkward small talk and long periods of silence. As soon as we arrived back at our apartment, Daniel's parents said a cheerful goodbye, completely unaware of the strain their presence had caused. Once they were gone, I turned to Daniel. We need to talk about this, I said firmly. He nodded, looking resigned. I know. I'm sorry, Nancy. I should have told you they were coming. It's not just that, I sighed. It's about boundaries, Daniel. Your parents can't keep showing up in our lives like this. We need to set some ground rules. Daniel nodded slowly. You're right. I'll talk to them. A few days after we returned, I was in the kitchen testing a new recipe when the doorbell rang. To my surprise, Melissa and Johnson were standing there with bright smiles, as if the vacation mess had never happened. Mandy, dear. Melissa exclaimed, giving me a quick hug as they walked in. We need your expertise. We were wondering if you could tell us which restaurants in the city have the most delicious food. I was caught off guard by the question. Well, I said slowly, there are quite a few great places. The French bistro downtown, Chez Etoile, is fantastic, and Sakura Sushi in Thai Cuisine on 3rd Avenue has some of the best sushi I've ever had. Why do you ask? Melissa's eyes lit up with excitement. Oh, we thought we'd keep an eye out for any open events at these restaurants, you know, so we can go and eat for free. I turned to Daniel, who had just walked into the room, hoping he would back me up. But he just shrugged and said, Come on, Nancy, you've got to accept my parents as they are. No use trying to change them. I was speechless. This felt like crossing a line, didn't it? But before I could respond, Melissa and Johnson thanked me and left, happily chatting about their plans to get free meals. A few days later, I was preparing for a review of a new upscale American restaurant, Ban 8. As usual, I posted the details of my visit on social media, letting my followers know when and where they could expect my next review. 
That evening, I arrived at Ban 8, settled into my table with my notebook in hand, ready to experience and evaluate the menu. I had just opened the wine list when I heard a familiar voice. Well, hello there. I looked up and saw Melissa and Johnson smiling as they sat down at my table without asking. My heart sank. Melissa picked up a menu and announced loudly, I'm Mandy's mother-in-law, you know. We're here to enjoy the free meal with her. I felt my face heat up with embarrassment. Melissa, I whispered, please keep your voice down. I'm here to work. You can't just show up like this. But Melissa wasn't listening. She raised her voice even more. Oh, don't be silly, dear. Everyone knows food critics eat for free. Why shouldn't your family enjoy the perks too? We have every right to be here. I could feel the eyes of other diners on us, and the head waiter was walking toward our table, looking concerned. This was getting out of control fast. Melissa, Johnson, I said firmly but quietly, this is your last warning. If you don't leave right now, I'll have no choice but to call security. You're interrupting my work and causing a scene. Melissa's face twisted with anger. She stood up quickly, her chair scraping against the floor. Well, I never, she shouted. Is this how you treat family, Mandy? As she grabbed her purse, she turned to me one last time, her voice full of disappointment. You know, I think I made a big mistake. I'm the one who told Daniel to marry you. I followed your Facebook page and thought, now there's a girl who could help us enjoy the finer things in life. I thought you'd take us to fancy restaurants for free, maybe even help us out a little. But I was wrong. If this is how you treat family, well, we're not interested in being part of yours anymore. With that, Melissa stormed out of the restaurant, Johnson following behind her. The silence that followed was deafening. My hands were shaking as I reached for my phone and dialed Daniel's number. He answered on the third ring. Daniel, I said, my voice barely a whisper, is it true? Did your mother really push you to marry me because she thought I'd provide for them? There was a long pause on the other end of the line. Finally, Daniel sighed. Yes, he admitted. Mom saw your success and thought, well, you know how she is. She insisted you'd be perfect for me, for us. It felt like the ground had disappeared beneath me. I hung up the phone and turned to the head waiter, who had been standing nearby. I'm really sorry for the disturbance, I said. I won't be able to finish my review tonight. Please give my apologies to the chef. As I gathered my things, I pulled out my phone again and quickly typed a message to my followers, explaining that due to unexpected events, my review of Bardi Sante would be postponed. The drive home was a blur, my mind racing to make sense of everything that had happened. When I walked through the door of our apartment, Daniel was waiting for me, his face full of worry. Nancy, he began, but I held up my hand to stop him. Why didn't you tell me? I asked softly, was I just a way for your family to get what they wanted? Daniel's face fell, and he reached for my hand. This time, I didn't pull away. No, Nancy, no. Well, yes, it started with my mom's idea, but I fell in love with you, not your job, not your connections, just you. I sank onto the couch, suddenly feeling drained. Daniel sat next to me, his eyes full of hope. I know I've made mistakes, he said quietly. I should have set boundaries with my parents a long time ago. But, Nancy, I love you. I want to make this right. Can we try to fix this? I looked at him, asterisk really asterisk looked at him. Despite everything, I knew I still loved him. As we sat there on the couch, our hands intertwined, I felt a small glimmer of hope. Maybe, just maybe, we could get through this and come out stronger. The next couple of months passed peacefully. Daniel worked on setting boundaries with his parents, and I threw myself into my work, trying to rebuild the trust in our relationship. 
Then, the moment I had worked toward for years finally came, my cookbook was published. It was more successful than I had ever dreamed. Major newspapers and magazines praised it, and it quickly became a bestseller on all the big online retailers. One evening, as I was scrolling through yet another glowing review, Daniel came home with a surprise. Let's celebrate your success, he said, his eyes sparkling with excitement. I've planned a trip to that charming city you've always wanted to visit. It has everything you love, great restaurants, historical sites, beautiful nature and I've booked us a room at that boutique hotel you've been eyeing. I paused for a moment, then asked the question that had been on my mind. It's just us, right? Your parents aren't coming. Daniel looked me straight in the eye. I promise, Nancy, it's just us. No parents, no surprises. The day of our trip arrived, and we made our way to the train station. Luggage in hand, feeling hopeful about what was ahead, my heart suddenly sank. There they were, Melissa and Johnson, waving enthusiastically. I turned to Daniel, hoping this was just a bad coincidence, but the guilty look on his face told me everything. I'm sorry, he mumbled, avoiding my eyes. I couldn't not invite them. Mom found out about the trip. In that moment, something inside me broke. All the promises, all the efforts of the past months, they meant nothing. But I forced a smile as Melissa and Johnson approached. I noticed they only had a small purse between them, no luggage. Where's your luggage? I asked, already knowing the answer. Melissa waved her hand dismissively. Oh, don't worry, dear. You'll handle everything, won't you? After all, we're celebrating your success. As the announcement for boarding came over the loudspeaker, we made our way onto the train. Once everyone settled into their seats, I stood up. I'm just going to use the restroom before we leave, I said, grabbing my purse with my phone and documents inside. I stepped off the train, feeling the cool air of the platform on my face. I stood there, watching as the train's doors closed the whistle blew, and it slowly began to pull away from the station. My phone buzzed in my purse, snapping me out of my thoughts. Daniel's name flashed on the screen. I took a deep breath and answered. Nancy, where are you? Daniel's panicked voice came through. We're not on the same path anymore, Daniel, I replied, my voice steadier than I felt. I'm divorcing you. I hung up before he could respond. My hand shook as I opened my banking app and blocked Daniel's access to our joint account. Barely a minute passed before my phone rang again. This time, it was Melissa. I held the phone away from my ear as she shouted insults and threats, demanding that I pay for their trip and compensate them for emotional distress. When she finally paused for breath, I spoke calmly, Melissa. I'm not afraid of your threats. If you post any slander, I won't hesitate to take legal action. I blocked her number, then Daniel's, and finally Johnson's, just to be sure. Taking a deep breath, I called a cab and went home. The weekend passed in a blur of emotions and practical tasks. I packed Daniel's belongings, contacted a lawyer, and drafted the divorce papers. By Friday morning, I felt drained but determined. The sound of a key turning in the lock made me tense. Daniel walked in, looking disheveled and desperate. Nancy, please, he said, walking toward me with open arms. I stepped back, pointing to the suitcases by the door. Your things are packed. It's time for you to go. His face crumpled. You don't mean that. I've learned my lesson, Daniel said, his voice desperate. I had a huge fight with my parents on the trip. I told them I'm not paying for them anymore. I'm not even talking to them now. Please, give me another chance. I shook my head and handed him the divorce papers. It's too late, Daniel. This isn't just about your parents, it's about trust, respect, and the life I want to live. 
We want different things, and that's okay. But I can't do this anymore. After a long pause, Daniel nodded, his shoulders slumping in defeat. He picked up his suitcases and walked out, closing the door behind him with a quiet click. The next few weeks were hard, but they were also freeing. The divorce process went smoothly, thanks to my careful records and Daniel's acceptance of the situation. I threw myself into my work, finding comfort in cooking and writing. As things settled down, I found myself alone again, but it wasn't the loneliness I had once feared. I started to enjoy the little things again, trying new recipes, spending peaceful evenings with a good book, and connecting with my followers without the pressure of anyone's expectations. One evening, I sat on my balcony with a glass of wine, looking out over the city. I couldn't help but smile. Life hadn't gone the way I planned, but maybe it turned out exactly how it was meant to. I was Mandy again, food critic, author, and, most importantly, in control of my own life.